The emergency alert on my phone went off in a shrill noise, repeating three times and vibrating angrily, just as I was bringing up the last of my belongings into the cabin. I took the device from my pocket and stared at it in disbelief for at least a minute before the realization set in, one that I would have to leave only moments after arriving. My hands were shaking from the cold as I read through it again. Severe weather alert. Heavy snowfall in the frenetic region is expected to begin tomorrow. 60 to 80 centimeters of precipitation. Not good. I realized the roads would be impassable by this time the following day. That meant that I would have to leave early the next morning to avoid being stuck in the roads in the blizzard, which subsequently meant zero ice fishing time for me. I'd be lucky to make it home before it started coming down in earnest. Moments later, messages started coming up from my three friends who had planned to join me. The group chat notification popped up on my phone, and I opened it. Did you see the emergency alert about the storm? Guess this trip's off. What a bunch of bullshit. Oh my god. Generational storms, what they're calling it now. Looks like we'll have to postpone for a few weeks. Hope you didn't go through with your plans to go up a day early, Jay. No kidding. What are the chances this blizzard hits us in an icy fishing weekend? I messaged back, saying that I understood that we'd be rescheduling. I told them I'd make the trip up alone, accompanying the messages with forehead-slapping emojis. Sucks that I'd be stuck up here alone, I thought to myself. My dog, Gibson, pawed at my leg, and I smiled at her, feeling slightly reassured by her presence. Yeah, you're right, Gibby. I'm not completely alone. At least I got you here with me. After putting down a bowl of water and another containing kibble, my next priority was to start a fire in the small black stove at the center of the main living area. There was wood stacked up in a neat pile next to it, and small bags containing kindling, which we'd brought with us this summer and left behind. At first glance, it looked like a large enough stack, but I knew from experience that it would need twice as much as it appeared to make it through the night, so I went outside to gather more from beneath the boathouse. The family cottage was a rustic one, to put it mildly. There was no running water, no electricity, and the cabin was poorly insulated. Perennially procrastinated repairs were needed in more than one place, including the floor beneath one bed which had partially collapsed, letting in a slight trickle of cold air from outside. It was drafty, and I could hear the sounds of mice which had made their way through the gaps, burrowing in the bedroom and finding their way into an old coat or sleeping bag that someone had left behind. I sighed as I lit the kerosene lamps which were scattered on wobbly tables around the main living area. There was something about having vermin in the cottage that set me on edge. But at least Gibson's presence would keep them at a distance. After filling the place with a warm, flickering glow from the half-dozen kerosene lamps, it felt a little better. There was reassurance in having fire, but I started working on making a big one in the stove that would keep me warm through the night. I loosely watered up some newspapers and then stacked dry kindling on top, making a teepee. Over that, I added larger pieces of wood until I was piling up to the ceiling of the small stove. Then I lit a strip of cardboard and held it up to the paper inside, catching it alight from several places, watching as it began to burn, and then flared up in a bright, white-orange glow. Holding my hands up to the fire, I watched it and I warmed myself up. Eventually, I took off my boots and my coat, the entire cottage gradually getting toasty. There's no sense in unpacking, I thought, taking a beer out of the cooler and opening it. I took a sip and couldn't help but grimace at the taste. I'd never tried the brand before, and I picked it up on a recommendation. It was awful, and lukewarm to boot, par for the course, considering the trip so far. I took out my phone and watched Netflix while the beer went flat beside me. I lifted Gibson up onto the futon with me so that she was off the floor, close to the fire where it was warm. Eventually, I got bored of the office reruns, and I called it a night, adding another log to the fire and reminding myself to wake up in an hour to keep it going. Pulling the futon even closer to the stove so that it was as close to the fire as safety would allow, I curled up in my sleeping bag and drifted off into an uncomfortable slumber, constantly tossing and turning, trying to stay warm, but not succeeding. I woke up to the sound of whining coming from Gibson, trembling on the bed beside me. I was so cold that I was actually scared. My teeth were chattering uncontrollably, and I realized a few hours had passed. The fire had gone out completely, reduced to mere embers at the base of the stove. 
I put on my jacket and blew hot breath onto my fingers, pulling Gibson closer to me. She was shaking badly as well. My hands are trembling as I put more newspaper and kindling onto the fire, blowing into the embers and hoping they would reignite. My lungs felt frozen, my heart was beating fast, my skin prickled with pins and needles turning into total numbness in my extremities. I'd never felt so cold in my life, and realized it was far beyond the weather forecast on the news. It seemed like it was in the minus 30 degrees, steadily dropping further. Terrified that I would not be able to get my body temperature back up, my mind started racing, thinking of worst-case scenarios. If I couldn't stop shaking pretty soon, it'd be impossible to start a fire again. I recalled that my truck was just outside, and I could get in there and start it up, turning on the heat until I felt warm again. But the idea of going out there and the, the truck refusing to start was too much to take, and considering the state of the beat-up old Ford, that seemed like a distinct possibility. So I continued stoking the fire, blowing on the precious few embers and adding more newspaper every so often until a tiny flame began to glow. I held my shaking hands up to the measly fire and added pieces of kindling sparingly, one by one, terrified of it going out again. Pulling Gimpson closer, we shared each other's warmth, and I began to feel halfway human again. A sound came from outside the cabin suddenly, startling me and causing me to jump. My heart skipping a beat, then pounding faster and faster in my chest. A noise. Like fingernails being dragged across the siding could be heard from all around, echoing in the small space. Something was going from one end of the cottage to the other, attempting to get inside. Deep, guttural breathing could be heard, grunting and snorting, desperate as it scraped its talons against the boarded-up windows. Gibson began to whine, making high-pitched noises as she huddled closer to me, and I put my hand over her muzzle, muffling her sounds. Was it a bear? I wondered. I realized I was holding my breath. I thought about the holes in the flimsy facade of the cabin, the spot beneath the bed where the mice were getting in. I thought about the broken screen door and the, the wooden one behind that which needed to be replaced, almost falling off its rusty hinges. The entire cottage felt so frail and insecure all of a sudden as I heard the loud noise of whatever that thing was breathing heavily just outside trying to get in. Maybe it was too cold out there even for it. The ground shook with the weight of the creature as it made its way around the cabin. I was so focused on it that I didn't notice the fire going out again at first as it fizzled down to embers. I continued holding my breath until it was gone. And then I relit the fire, my shaking hands barely able to get it going again. Once it was burning hot, I didn't sleep anymore. I pulled Gibson close, and the two of us stayed up all night watching the fire with weary eyes, taking occasional glances at the door. Even once we were both warm, we continued to shiver. When the sun came up, I didn't notice at first. It was dark in the cottage one minute, and then it was light. I blinked my eyes a few times and rolled out of bed, deciding I'd waste no more time before leaving. Just hope the bear or whatever had been outside the night before was gone. Gibson was scratching at the front door, asking to be let outside to pee, which told me that it was probably safe now. In the light of the morning, all that had happened seemed like a bad nightmare. I told myself, maybe it had been until I got outside and I saw the claw marks which marred the exterior walls. Shuddering, I threw my belongings in the truck, doused the fire with too much water, and took one last look at the place. What a shitty weekend this has turned out to be, I thought to myself. With more people around, it was easier to keep the fire going, taking turns feeding it with wood so that everyone could sleep through the night. But it was frightening being up here by myself, even with Gibson by my side. I'd never done it before in the winter, and I never would again. Too many things that could go wrong. Freak snowstorm, fallen tree blocking the road, getting stuck, or going into a ditch. Those were just the beginning. I wanted to get out of here before any of those things could happen. The truck didn't want to start at first. I turned the key in the ignition twice, hearing only a click and the absence of any engine noises. 
Cursing loudly, I checked to make sure that I hadn't left an interior light on or something which could have drained the battery. Satisfied there was still a charge, I tried one more time, and finally, the old shitbox let out a cough and kicked into life. The engine began to sputter before finally settling into a steady, rusted purr. All right, Gibson, let's get out of here, I said, rubbing the dog's head and smiling as she blinked her eyes. She looked content in the front seat, smiling to be back in the truck and out of the old cottage. There was a thin layer of snow on the gravel road, and the, the tires got moving easily enough. I looked up to see the sky was turning gray above me. A few white flakes were just beginning to fall. The weather was making an early appearance. I turned on the radio, and sure enough, they said the same thing I was thinking. The storm would be arriving early. By noon, the highways would be a parking lot. White out conditions. Be prepared to be trapped in your car. Have emergency supplies ready. My anxiety was through the roof as I went around a bend in the road, hitting the gas. I came to the first big hill and I went over it, seeing something strange up ahead as I came over the rise. Whatever it was, it was blocking the road. Massive and brown, the lumpy, furry shape got bigger as I pulled up in front of it. The bear, which had been trying to get into my cottage the night before, was dead. Lying in the middle of the gravel road and blocking it completely. At first, I thought it had frozen to death. I got out of my truck and I inspected it. I was surprised to find that there was a horrible smell coming from the carcass. It was a, a chemical smell. Noxious and unpleasant, like some sort of factory waste. The snow had melted all around the beast, and blood and entrails were pooling around the far side. The hell could do such a thing? I mean, aren't bears the top of the food chain? They're, they're alpha predators. Gibson was by my side, but she did not venture near the body. Usually she'd be curious, trying to sniff at something like that, but she stayed next to me, emitting a low growl. The road was completely blocked, I realized. There's no way out, unless I could move it. But no matter which way I attempted it, the giant body of the dead bear would not budge. It weighed a ton. There were large trees on either side of the road, too close to drive past. There was only one other way out, which was driving across the frozen lake, and that... that was way too risky. I hadn't been able to test the thickness of the ice yet. It would need to be nearly a foot deep for me to feel comfortable. But there was a clear way on and off the ice if it came down to it. I got back in the truck and I threw it in reverse. Since there was no way to turn around, I felt sick to my stomach, nervous with anticipation and fear, uncertain of how I was going to get out of here. Once back in front of the cottage, I got out of the truck and went down to the ice with my spud. Walking out into the lake, I cleared a spot with my boot and began to dig with a sharpened metal rod. Satisfied that I had found the bottom of the ice, I put the tape measure through the hole, hoping that it would be close to a foot. Looking at the tape measure... My heart sank. The ice was barely seven inches thick, just below the minimum eight inches where I would need to be safe to drive a vehicle across, and my truck was on the heavier side. I'd feel more comfortable if it was a full foot thick or more. I pulled out my phone and I checked for a signal, deciding it was time to call someone for help. Now, who would I call? I still wasn't sure, but I knew I couldn't get out of this jam by myself. I muttered out loud, seeing the signal bar was down to zero, and the words no service were printed across the top of the screen. Surely I would have gotten another severe weather warning by now, I realized, had it not been for the total lack of cell signal. But the snow was now being dumped down on me from above, and the sky had turned nearly black with the approaching storm. I typed out a message in the group chat telling them my situation, hitting send regardless of the lack of signal. I knew from experience it would go through eventually. I just hoped it would be sooner rather than later. Gibson let out a loud, high-pitched whine. Her tone rose in volume, and she began to bark. High, persistent yips that were totally unlike her. She backed away, then let out a stream of urine, her hind legs trembling as she did. I looked up from my phone and saw what her eyes had spotted. Across the lake, something was moving in the trees. I saw fingers wrapping around a tree trunk too high up, the nails too long, too sharp to be a person's. 
Whatever the giant was, it looked similar to a man, but it was it was massive. It peered out at me from between the boughs of trees, its head probably fifteen feet off the ground. Its skeletal limbs matched the monochromatic tone of the birches on either side of it. A gray, pale, white shade. I couldn't distinguish the entire form of it in the shadows, but I couldn't make out its eyes. They reflected back at me, catching the gray light coming through the clouds. Then I saw its mouth spread wider in a grin, teeth dripping blood, and its and it disappeared back into the darkness. The temperature felt like it had dropped 30 below freezing again. As I began to shiver involuntarily, I looked down to see Gibson was doing the same. There was only one choice, only one place where we could go. The cabin. It was either that or plunging the truck into a frozen lake attempting to drive across. We were on a small peninsula surrounded by water on all sides. Only one way in or out, and that was blocked by the body of a giant brown bear. I took the dog back inside the cottage and locked the doors, taking uneasy glances outside through the cracks in the boarded-up windows. What the hell was that thing in the forest? I asked myself over and over again, but no answer could come to mind. There was no creature that I could think of that was fifteen feet tall, had reflective eyes which stood on two legs like a man capable of disemboweling a full-grown bear, capable of causing this temperature to plunge all around me. There was only one creature capable of that, and it wasn't supposed to exist. It, it was something from myth, folklore, from legends that weren't supposed to be real. When to go, I said aloud, immediately regretting the words, as if saying them made it true, as if saying them would summon it. They were supposed to be supernatural creatures born of Canadian First Nation folklore. I mean, they live in cold, remote places, and they make people go mad. Merely through their presence, they thrive on the hunger, the despair, and the loneliness of their victims, who usually live in remote communities, they drive families apart, instill urges of cannibalism in people, making them want to consume their own loved ones. During the lean, hard months of winter, they turned people into raving cannibals, driving away all their loved ones, and then once you're alone, the Wendigo strikes. It either consumes you while you're still alive, tearing the flesh from your bones, while you beg and you scream, or, or it turns you into one of its own kind. The Wendigo's greatest curse is that no matter how much flesh it consumes, it only grows hungrier. With every ounce of meat it takes in, it grows taller, more emaciated. Its, its hunger grows more insatiable with its height until it's a towering beast with its head amongst the treetops as it roams the forest, constantly searching for its next meal. Gimpson whimpered, burrowed her face into my armpit, as if hearing my inner thoughts. Trying to reassure her, I stroked her fur and told her it would be okay. Although I had a feeling that it wouldn't be. I tried to get the fire going again, but it was a fruitless effort. Everything inside the stove was damp and wet, and I scolded myself for dousing the fire with so much water. Still, I kept at it, knowing we might be stuck there for a while. Pretty soon, the wind was howling and blowing outside, and the snow was piling up in front of the door. I made a point of opening it every so often to clear the front steps, knowing that we would need firewood taking weary glances off into the forest across the lake as I did so. Finally, I got the fire started, a low, guttering flame in the stove which wanted to go out all the time. Everything was damp, but I kept feeding fresh kindling to it, nursing it, until it kept going by itself. Hours passed as we waited to either run out of firewood or be attacked by the creature. We were running low on kindling and the sun was beginning to set. My stomach rumbled with hunger, and I felt something strange. The ground was suddenly shaking beneath my feet, and I heard Gibson whining from beside me. What is it, girl? I asked, my voice catching in my throat as I, I realized the answer. It was the creature. It was back. The dining table began to rattle and bounce up and down as whatever was outside got closer, and I imagined the huge creature lifting the roof from the cabin like the 
with the cloche on a dish in a fancy restaurant, picking me up, eating me whole like a wriggling shrimp. A second later, there was a second sound at the front door, metal being ripped and sheared as I realized the creature was making its way in. The screen door landed on the ground with a crash, and the wooden door was being torn from its hinges in an instant later. Cold air rushed inside as Gibson began to let out shrill, panicked barks of terror. I heard the thing tearing apart the front entrance, easily ripping apart the wood and making the doorway larger so that it could come inside. I tipped over the dining room table to use as a barricade. I picked up a chair, the only weapon that I could find nearby, thinking I'd have to throw it at the thing's face to defend us. But I heard a strange noise from out front. It was a car horn. Someone had come to save me. I heard a loud ding and pulled out my phone and saw the green check mark beside my group chat message, indicating that at some point it had gone through, at some brief moment when there had been a gap in the clouds. Reading the one received message on my phone, a hopeful smile spread across my face. You just had to skip town a day early to go ice fishing, didn't you? The hell is that thing? Ted was yelling from outside. I don't know, but it's trying to get inside. Jay, are you there? I shouted back that I was. There was a loud screech from outside, which I realized had come from the monster. They had actually wounded it somehow. I ran to the front door with Gibson and looked out, seeing the creature for the first time. It stood with its back to us, its head amongst the treetops, even taller than it appeared at first. My friends had caught it off guard, but now it was fully aware of them. It was going after them. The Wendigo was distracted by something in front of the cottage, and I realized one of my friends had gotten out of the car, and they were using themselves as bait so that it could flee the cottage safely. They had driven across the ice with their lighter vehicle, just as I had hoped to do. I guess they'd also run into trouble moving the body of the giant bear, which blocked the road. Jay! Ted screamed out of the window driving the car in circles in the ice as if too terrified to stay still. I ran over to the car, slipping and sliding on the lake of ice. It was Matt who was distracting the Wendigo, I realized, and I called for him to get away from the thing. It was too large and too fast. He didn't know what he was dealing with. And that was Matt. He was always the act first and then think later type. Not only that, but he often put himself in harm's way for his friends. He turned to look at me and gave me a thumbs up. His attention diverted from the creature for a split second too long. As Gibson and I got into the car, we heard his screams. And I looked to see the Wendigo had closed the distance in an instant. And he was picking him up like an insect, turning him and taking bites from him in places. As Matt screamed for help, the creature peeled off his skin, exposing his skull as he ate his face. The calls for help turned to bubbling gurgles and wet, choked sounds, and I nearly got out of the car to run after him, but Ted grabbed my wrist and pulled me back inside. Can't save him, he said with wet, red-rimmed eyes. Eventually, I relented. We raced across the icy lake, making a path through the blizzard, cutting a swath out of the fresh-fallen snow on our way back to the main roads. For a while, we debated what to do. Should we call the police? I mean, our friend had just died after all. But we knew that if we did, we'd be considered suspects, and with no other reasonable explanation, they'd pin the death on us. They'd say we killed him. There was no box we could check on the official report that said Wendigo attack after all. I mean, such things didn't exist. They were myths, they were legends. As it turned out, we wouldn't have to worry about it. A message popped up from Matt on the group chat just a few minutes after we got home. I had to tell myself that it wasn't all just a nightmare, a hallucination from the cold and a lack of sleep and food. But Ted and Greg, they both told me I hadn't imagined it. What we saw was real. As much as I wish that it wasn't. The three of us read the message in the group chat again and again. My heart was beating fast and a sick knot was growing in my stomach, bile rising in my throat that I could, I could taste inside of my mouth. Hey guys, you really missed out on a feast. Ice fishing is just as much fun in a blizzard, if not more. Let's reschedule the trip for next weekend, okay? I'll be waiting for you here. As much as we don't want to go, we can't leave Matt like that. 
We have to help him. Next weekend, we're making the trip back up there. Even if it kills us. I just want to point you guys in the direction of the snake's paw. If you guys are listening right now on a podcast, then hey, uh, you're pretty much already there. If you're not listening on the podcast and you're listening on the YouTube, then hey, you're basically already there. The snake's paw is written by Jack Townsend, who also happens to write Tales from the Gas Station, and Finding Vanessa, which I've heard that some of you people like. If you want to find some more of his amazing writing, as well as a full cast of voices that is brought to life within this amazing podcast that's hilarious and frightening at the same time, then I strongly, strongly suggest you check it out. That's The Snake's Paw. And you can also go to thesnakespaw.com. A big thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Jacob Fenske, Stephanie Butler, Jordan Humble, Chance Burnett, Dana Kraus, Brimstone Pandemonium, Kel Tuna, William Wellington, Emma, Brenna Crow, Lakeda Canazales, Smiley the Psychotic, Dante Kincaid, Simba's Buddy Mojo, Mephistopheles, Curse Pox Primark, Bastion Beefcake, M, Jesus Corneo, Yargul, Crownable, Amber Clark, Jay Kearns, Dakota Lane Whetstone, Himbo Jerry, Crusader Chocobo, Adam Arias, Estabeen, Nick Cole, Our Minsec Time, Xyla Bones, Angelus, Seclude, Salty Surprise, Levita Galvin, That Creepy Chick, Red Shadow Cat, Turtle Man, Carolinia, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Ica Limchok, Dirty Diver 030, Matt Bach, Voice of Sand, Spike Mel, Melted Lake, Tolly Sue, William King, Darth Miver, Sashi Sasaku, Crokinut 509, Cricket, Ready Kruger, Lisa Cottrell, Katie's Nephew, Acid System, Mog, Kiwi the Sloth, Master's Lampshade, Nico Kyle, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, and Corey Kenshin. To all of you guys, I cannot thank you enough. Thank you for being a huge support to me. Thank you to everybody who's in the description down below, and thank you to everyone who can even support $1 just on Patreon to help keep the content coming.